Great. Thank you all. We have a traffic jam on I-95, and some people might be um, filtering in as we uh, speak, so we might as well get started, though. Uh, okay. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. My name is Steve McMenamin, uh, and I'm your host for today's event, which is part of the continuing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Uh, our topic this morning, Understanding Skill, the Quest for Outperformance and Fee Premiums, is part three of our examination of the secret sauce that's the foundation for above market fees. Um, as luck would have it, we've managed to persuade three of the most knowledgeable experts to share their views, and I'll introduce them in alphabetical order after I say this. Uh, the speakers use of their own and don't necessarily represent the views of the roundtable. Uh, and having said that, um, I, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Kent Daniel. He is the professor of finance at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business. Before Columbia, Professor Daniel was the John and Helen Kellogg Distinguished Professor of Finance at Kellogg uh, University, and before that, he was on the faculties of the University of Chicago and the University of British Columbia. Uh, from 2004 and, um, and 2010, uh, Kent was a managing director and co-CIO of the Quantitative Investment Strategies uh, Group at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Uh, Kent's academic research, uh, both theoretical and empirical, has been primarily in the area of behavioral finance and asset pricing. Uh, Kent is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He has served as an associate editor for the Journal of Finance uh, and a director of the American Finance Association and as a director of the Western Finance Association. Um, sitting um, uh, to uh, Kent's left, and I'm going to skip over Dan just a second because he's out of alphabetical order, is um, <laughs> Uh, uh, Pete Hecht is a managing director and co-head of the North American Portfolio Solutions Group at AQR, a very large hedge fund here in town. Uh, in this role, Pete focuses on advising clients on portfolio challenges and investment strategies and developing thought leadership and investor education pieces. Before AQR, Pete was a senior investment strategist with Evanston Capital Management. Uh, he has also served in various portfolio and strategic roles for all states' insurance portfolio and pension plan. Uh, before that, Pete was an assistant professor of finance at the Harvard Business School. And um, sitting next to Pete, uh, Daniel Wallach is a principal in Vanguard Investment Strategy Group, where he develops solutions for institutional clients. Uh, his work on endowment and foundation-related topics, including <coughs> portfolio construction, alternative investments, and risk, has been published extensively. Um, Dan was involved in establishing the Vanguard Capital Markets Model, Vanguard Target Retirement Funds, and the company's use of tender option bonds. Uh, he is also named in conjunction with a financial patent for working in connection with Vanguard managed payout funds. Uh, before Ban Vanguard, Mr. Wallach worked in public finance where he was responsible for the issu issuance of more than $10 billion worth of debt. And the moderator of the roundtable today is Kurt Schacht, a managing director of the CFA Institute in New York, where he runs the uh, CFA Institute's professional standards, industry ethics, and government relations practice. Uh, Kurt is the chairman of the Investment Advisory Committee for the SEC and a member of, the, uh, of our programming committee. So please welcome Kurt as he sets the table for today's discussion. Kurt. Thank you, Steve. I got, I got stereo here. Um, <laughs> I'll take this one. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for, for joining us here. Thanks to Steve. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for making their way over to the lovely Bruce Museum this morning. I wish the weather was a little better, but it is what it is. Um, and we are on a quest this morning. The topic that Steve uh, noted is something that has been taken on before here at the Greenwich Roundtable, as you probably know, um, skill in investment management. And to be honest, it's, it, it's been very pervasive at most all of the CFA Institute events that we have been doing. People very concerned about the value proposition of active management, and we talk about it quite regularly. Um, not that we haven't heard about this before. It's been decades long. Um, academics and the indexers and Mr. Bogle have been banging the drum for a long time about the inability of actives to, uh, to outperform the market. Um, I don't know if, if what you think, but I think we're at an inflection point based on a lot of the stuff that we're hearing. We've, we, we've thinking there was going to be a big shift for many, many years now, and the question is, have we finally arrived at that inflection point? Um, 
are, are people really starting to take much more stock of how they use active and how it how they how they view that service um, I was frankly um, quite taken aback at our Montreal annual meeting just four weeks ago up in Montreal we had over 2,000 CFAs investment practitioners uh, other interested investors attend our annual meeting up in Montreal uh, and the buzz about the tension about uh, the, no the notion of the value proposition of our profession was, was palpable. Um, our Euro investors in particular were all abuzz about the latest S&P statistics about um, performance. Four out of five uh, managers in the Eurozone um, failed to outperform the index in, uh, in five years. Eighty-six percent of them fail in over the 10-year framework. They were looking at some 30,000-plus products in the Eurozone. 100% of the actively managed equity funds sold in the Netherlands, 95% of those sold in Switzerland failed to perform uh, over five years. Um, the U.S. numbers aren't, aren't any better. Um, looking at 6,500, 7,000 some products, um, pretty much the same result. 89% failed to uh, outperform their benchmarks over five years, 82% uh, over the last decade, uh, according to the S&P. Now, maybe these aren't exactly the products that you guys are investing in or interested in, but your kids or your grandkids or anybody in your extended family that has investable assets, um, they have to, this is a big consideration. This is a very important consideration, the value for fees. And it wasn't just the traditional um, issues, uh, traditional assets. We talked a lot about the alternative space, a lot of hedge fund managers at this event, a lot of high net worth uh, investors. Uh, and they said this is an inflection point. Things have finally changed uh, f for us. Um, way tougher um, to do any sort of se a security selection strategy. Way too many investment managers to compete with. Um, our clients are much more focused on the cost, the fees associated with what service we provide. Lots of new low-cost alternatives uh, uh, using uh, financial technology. And one of them said, you know, my clients are probably as jumpy as they've ever been, given all of the discussion about fees and active management. And the old adage that we use as active managers um, to sort of quell that it is, you know, you can't be short-term. You have to be long-term perspective here. Um, paid less attention to those index benchmarks. It's all about the outcome for you. It's all about whether you have adequate uh, retirement assets. Uh, and then my favorite is that we offer that living, breathing factor, right? You have somebody that you can call, that you can connect with, that you can be in touch with. Uh, in good markets and in bad. And I think the reality of that is that middling performance, um, it, people are only willing to pay so much for that um, going forward. So what is really my value as an active manager? If I can't perform, if skill, <coughs> investment skill is all but dead, um, we're in a bit of a fix. And of course, as a CFA um, organization, um, we had nearly 200 or uh, 250,000 CFA candidates just two Saturdays ago. So we have people all over the world taking this test to learn these skills, to learn the skills of analysis and, and hopefully the skills of investment management. Um, another record year for us. And of course, we're very concerned and we're very um, concerned about the value and the popularity of this, of, of this credential. Um, if we are not particularly relevant, if we're, what we're teaching people doesn't translate into investment skills, what's going to happen in the next five years? So we worry about whether we're teaching typewriter maintenance skills or whether we should be teaching blockchain and more of a client service kind of, of uh, uh, aspect to our training. Right, so that's it. Um, inquiring minds want to know, does skills still exist? The question is, where does it exist? If it does exist, how do you know it's actually skill? How do you measure that? We're going to talk a little bit about share active and proper uh, performance attribution. And what do, you, what do you do as an investor in these times where performance is challenged? Does it, make, does it cause you to change behavior in terms of the managers you pick, the assets you select? Do you have a mix, a different sort of mix and approach to active versus passive? So it's a jungle. Um, we have three very thoughtful people here. They, they contemplate this and they reflect on, on these issues of performance and, and skill. Um, Kent Daniel, Columbia, Dan Wallach, Vanguard, and Pete Hecht from AQR. Delighted to have them. They're going to spend 15 minutes on remarks, and then we'll open it up to you guys for comments and, and observations. So thank you again for being here, Kent. Let's begin. It's a pleasure. Um, thanks for inviting me. The, so um, what I want to do is separate out the two questions. Um, the title of the session is The Quest for Outperformance and Fee Premia, but I guess I'm viewing those as two different questions. So um, 
In fact, when I was preparing my notes, I thought back. There was uh, somebody you've probably, most of you have heard of, Fisher Black, a uh, very famous academic co-developer of the Black-Scholes model. Uh, I heard him at a conference in the late 1990s, and at that time, he was addressing the question of why firms pay dividends because there have been lots of academic arguments arguing that firms shouldn't be paying dividends. They should be doing repurchases instead. Um, there was a famous paper by uh, Miller and Medigliani that argued that dividends were irrelevant, except when you took taxes into the equations, uh, dividends were definitely disadvantaged. So he went through all of these arguments and he said, but I know why managers pay dividends. <coughs> Fisher was a very quirky guy. For those of you who ever met him, you will know this. But he said, I know why they pay dividends managers, because they want to. And then he went on to the next topic. So I'm hoping I'll have a little more depth than that. But uh, <laughs> um, the more I think about it, though, Fisher's comment, I think, was a very interesting one. Um, why are investors paying large fees? Because they want to. Now, of course, that begs the question, of what it is investors think they're getting and whether they're getting that and whether that perception is going to change. So that's something I want to come back to in a minute, okay? Um, so when we talk about um, outperformance or alpha in the academic sphere, it means one thing. The argument that we generally make in academia, not always in my work, I do a little bit of wacky behavioral stuff, but I think most people argue that investors are rational. And they're only willing to pay high fees if they think they're going to get outperformance for that. Um, now, where does this outperformance come from? Well, there's a, there's a big literature in economics and finance about this. In fact, one of the main contributors to this literature was a guy, Sandy Grossman, who some of you may know of. He's uh, turned into a fund manager. Um, and uh, Grossman kind of showed early on that um, if there's no one in the market, if there's nobody out there who's behaviorally biased, if everybody's <coughs> rational, if there's nobody demanding liquidity, nobody who kind of has to sell for non-valuation-based reasons, then you're going to get this interesting situation where nobody can earn fees. And the intuition would be, let's say I go out and I gather lots of information. I spend lots of time, lots of resources in uh, coming up with something that gives me an information <coughs> advantage. Well, now, if I go out to trade, nobody's going to want to trade with me because they'll know I've gathered that information. So this begged the question, of course, you know, why do we see trade? Uh, why do we see, presumably, some people earning returns to their information? So there was a, a follow-up paper by Grossman and Stiglitz, Stiglitz at Columbia, and they argued that what, what is a key thing that allows um, rents to be earned from information is that there are traders out there in the world that we call noise traders or liquidity traders, okay? And the idea here is there's some people who have to trade because, for example, you, you've just had a shock to your wealth, you need to raise some money, so you need to sell off some assets, okay? So that would be an example of a liquidity trader. And Grossman and Stiglitz argue that the way you as an informed trader can make money as you gather information and then you disguise yourself. You try and look like somebody who is in the market selling for non-information-based reasons, but rather for liquidity reasons, okay? Um, now, there's a, a paper that I did with a couple of co-authors in 2001. We extend this to a behavioral setting. We argue that the noise traders that are out there are not just people who are demanding liquidity, but rather also people who are just making mistakes. Um, probably a lot of you are aware of, there's a, a very famous line of research by Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, the Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in Economics now a few years ago. He recently wrote a very good book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that if you haven't read, you should. Um, and the argument is that you know there are lots of biases in the way we make decisions, in the way we process information, in the way we take the information that we're given and make decisions. And this causes people to do lots and lots of dumb things. And arguably, if you're an investor who is very careful about avoiding these biases and you have some better information than others out there, then you can uh, earn rents on your information. Okay, that's, that's basically where you're taking advantage, uh, where you're making money in the markets is by taking advantage of the mistakes that others make. But it's very important that um, there have to be these noise traders out there in some form, either demanding liquidity or making mistakes. If you don't have those, you're not going to make money, okay? 
Um, the other thing that, that in particular we show in our paper with Hirschleifer and Subramaniam is once you have multiple informed agents out there gathering the same information and trading on that, what's going to happen, even if you're gathering valuable information, okay, even if it's really, really good information, if you've got more than a few people who have that same information, you're not going to earn rents. And of course, the reason is pretty straightforward. It's competition. If you have the same information as other people, then you're going to compete with each other. You're going to push prices up to a level that the prices fully reflect that information, and you won't be able to earn abnormal returns. Okay? So this is kind of the academic background. Now, um, the question is, to what extent has competition really eliminated the ability of funds to, um, to make money? Okay? Now, um, what Kurt was saying a minute ago, let me take issue with something you said. Because you said, you know, the, the question that a lot of people are asking is, is skill dead? Can skill earn returns? Okay? We've seen lots of underperformance lately. Let me just raise the point that if you go back in the literature, there was actually a very famous paper <coughs> by Mike Jensen in 1968 that showed that if you looked at mutual fund performance for, I can't remember, the 40 years leading up, probably not 40 years, but the, say the 25 years leading up to 1968, the average manager, mutual fund manager that he looked at, underperformed by 1.25%. Okay? Um, so the average manager earned gross of fees about the same at the market, and net of fees, they earned a negative alpha by about the amount of the fees. This makes perfect sense. At some level, as long as that's a relatively large segment, that's exactly what you've got to expect. The average manager is not going to beat the index. That's always been the case, and I would argue that'll always be the case going forward. The question is whether exceptional managers can beat the index, okay? And this is something that, um, that academics have started to take a lot more seriously, and I think we've gotten some pretty good evidence suggesting that there are at least some managers who are able to consistently beat the index. But of course, they're doing it at the, at, you know, when they're making profits, somebody else is necessarily losing profits. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a very nice website that, in fact, Mike Mobisant <coughs> pointed me to called Philosophical Economics. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, again, it's worth taking a look at. Um, and the, uh, I'm actually not sure who writes this blog. Um, in fact, if anybody knows, if you could point me to him, I'd be very interested in, in getting in touch with him. He's very, very sharp. I'm not sure I agree with everything he says, but these are definitely worth reading. So he recently, in the last few weeks, put up, posted an article called The Paradox of Active Management. Okay? Now, his thesis in the series of articles, series of blogs that lead up to this, are that we would all be better off with less active management in the world. Um, and um, let me just spend a couple minutes on his argument uh, before I conclude. Uh, he argues that most funds deal in a specific asset class. So what he argues is, first off, if you've got a setup like the one that we've got, okay, there were, where there are relatively few funds doing kind of asset allocation across different asset classes, but you've got a lot of funds doing bets within asset classes, then what you can expect is that there are going to be very big uh, relative misvaluations, where some asset classes are likely to do very well going forward and some are likely to do very poorly. This seems reasonable to me. The other thing he argues is that um, the um, the relative valuations within an asset class, so for example, one equity compared to another, right, or across currencies, or um, within, a pri within the private equity space, that those valuations should pretty much be spot on. There should be very little, so there should be large absolute, uh, very absolute misvaluations, very small relative misvaluations, okay? The other argument he makes is you only need a few active managers to compete to make the market efficient. Okay? He argues there are way too many active managers now. Now, at some level, this seems wrong to me. Okay? And let me tell you first kind of intuitively why this is. Um, there's a big literature in economics, started really by Hayek, um, the, the, the very famous economist from kind of the World War II era, World War II, uh, yeah. Um, and Hayek argued that, in fact, 
the benefit of having free and open markets where you have lots and lots of people making bets is that's how information, dispersed information, Hayek made the argument that information is necessarily spread out across large swaths of the population. And unless you have lots and lots of individuals who are seeing little bits of information on the ground, you're not going to get good aggregation of information into prices. Okay? Prices are not going to be accurate. If you went to move to a world where you had only a few active managers okay, who were experts who were trying to set prices, he would argue they're not going to be set very well. By the way, this is very consistent with, there's a great book from a few years ago, The Wisdom of Crowds by James Surowiecki that makes kind of the same point. And in fact, for those of you who've read the recent book, uh, Super, Fest, Super Forecasters by Phil Tetlock, um, he argues that one of the really key attributes, or one of the really key attributes of good decision makers is that they rely on the wisdom of crowds. Okay? Um, so I would argue that you know, having a set of experts is not necessarily going to lead to efficient markets. Now, the, um, he, this, this guy, the, uh, 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 the philosophical economics uh, writer, also argues that there are some measures that suggest that misvaluations are just not really very big. There are a couple pieces of evidence that pretty much convince me that this is not true. Now, when, how would you know if, if value, misvaluations are big or not? Well, the only way you can confirm from an academic perspective that misvaluations are high is that you've got to see some set of managers who are consistently making money. Okay? Now, for me, or some set of investors, for me, the set of investors that do the best job out there are actually company managers. Okay? So what do I mean by this? There are a couple of papers, um, one by <coughs> Baker and Wergler, that look at something called equity share. Okay? And it turns out, by the way, I'll talk about the equity space here because this is a space that I know best, but you see similar measures working in other asset classes. It turns out when managers issue a whole bunch of equity, Okay, as a whole in the economy, uh, it turns out if you look at the, um, the periods in time where they're issuing the most equity relative to other securities like debt, okay, um, what you see is the average return on the market over the next year is about 6%. In contrast, if you look at the periods in time where managers are issuing the least fraction of equity relative to all issuance, you see the average return on the market is 14%. Okay, so there's an 8% difference. So what we see is at least in aggregate, okay, the managers of firms, when they make their decisions as to whether to issue equity or debt, they're really, really good at timing the market. Okay, now it turns out um, in another paper I've got with a guy, Sheridan Tipman, that we published in 2006, what we do is we look at a measure like this, um, except we look across different firms. So we look at who are the firms who are selling a whole bunch of equity and who are the firms that are repurchasing. And a kind of a, an innovation in this paper is we look at all the different ways that a firm can issue or repurchase equity. So for example, if you, um, if you do share finance acquisitions, well, it's just like issuing equity, right? If you pay your employees with stock, that's just like issuing equity. So it turns out with this measure, what we show is we build portfolios of uh, firms that issue a lot and firms that are repurchasing a lot. And we look at performance over the next three years, and we find the difference in the returns of those two portfolios is about 6% a year, 5.8% um, since, uh, since 1980. And it turns out it's about the same since 2000, I think 5.7%. So this suggests that at least managers have the information that allows them to pretty accurately forecast which direction their stock price is going to be going. Arguably, I would argue that what's going on is they're able to figure out if their firms are misvalued or not. Okay? Um, all right, now, um, two minutes. Okay, so let me, um, let me finish up. The one other paper I want to talk about that was written by uh, some colleagues of Peter at AQR is a paper called Buffett's Alpha. And again, I suspect some of you have seen this, but the argument that's made there is Warren Buffett, it if you turns out, if you look at Berkshire Hathaway and its performance, if you look at all equities um, that have been alive for at least 30 years, okay, Berkshire Hathaway has the highest Sharpe ratio 
of all equities out there. If you compare Berkshire Hathaway's performance to, um, to all mutual funds that exist, okay, that have a relatively long life, it turns out it's the second highest Sharpe ratio, okay? So again, Berkshire Hathaway has kind of uh, an amazing record of success. Now, the interesting thing about the Buffett's Alpha paper is they go in and they do a diagnosis and they figure out what is it that Buffett has been doing, okay? And basically what Buffett has been doing is he's been investing in value stocks, he's been investing in low volatility stocks, okay? And he's been using kind of cheap sources of leverage. Again, if you haven't seen this paper, it's a phenomenal paper. Um, now, interestingly, most of his performance is explained by these two features. You know, so should Buffett have earned extraordinary fees? Well, the argument I would make is yes, right? The reason is because nobody knew that these were the recipes for success at this time. And Buffett, I would argue, through a very, you know, kind of uh, a lot of insight, figured this out. Interestingly, there's another paper, um, and I'll send something around with, with these references, but there's another paper that shows that almost every other mutual fund or <coughs> asset management company out there didn't pay attention to something, things like value, growth, volatility, these kinds of tilts, okay? Um, the, now, the argument that gets made in this paper, the one point I take, where I take issue with this paper is they argue that you know, now you can go out and you can buy basically smart beta funds that will allow you to earn this same performance. And that's where I get a little bit worried, okay? And this goes back to the basic academic literature, which says that when there's competition between investors, if investors are all using the same information or the same strategies, that's going to lead to crowding and that's going to lead to underperformance. So in the end, the basic economic truth comes through that the only way that you're going to earn rents is if you find information out there that is distinct from what other investors are using, okay? Once you're doing the same thing as other investors are doing, it's unlikely that you will be able to earn high returns. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you, Ken. Mr. Waller. Thank you. The biggest but, indexer in the world. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so you may be expecting a certain uh, delivery from me, being from Vanguard, about the uh, value of indexing at a uh, active uh, discussion, but let, let me uh, t let you in on probably the largest secret in the investment management business, which is that Vanguard manages nearly a trillion dollars of active management, and we have for 40 years. And a lot of the research I've been doing for the last decade is around active management. So let me share some of you. Everything I'm going to talk to you about is published research that we've done, uh, and if you want any of it, you can go on my LinkedIn site. It's all available there, or you can Google it. Um, so let me let me uh, just preface it with that. Let me, let me start by addressing a couple of the comments that I made before and then get into my remarks. So Kurt discussed some numbers that get discussed a lot about the probability of any public, long-only, active manager outperforming the market. And that, the probability there, those numbers are really low. We've done that same calculation. The one thing I would suggest to you with those numbers is that's a count basis, right? If you look at the, the value of market cap, right, market cap's based on the zero-sum theory, right? Sharp articulated this in, 90, in 91 very clearly. The, zero, the, the, the zero-sum theory is based on assets, not count, right? That 50% of the assets at any one point in time are going to outperform, and 50% of the, of the assets are going to underperform, and that's where you get the market cap, which is the median of all of that. If you actually asset weight managers on public managers, rather than count them, the numbers of performance get closer to the theory of 50-50. And then, as Kent was saying, if you control for cost, those numbers go absolutely to the theory. If you, if you assume no cost whatsoever, you actually have, depending on the time period you're looking at, slight outperformance. You can get 55% outperformance. So what does that tell me? There's absolutely alpha out there. The problem is most people are charging way too much for it. I don't know if you want to hear that or not, but that's, that's our experience. And let me share some of you some, some research that we've done. And obviously I have more access to Vanguard funds than other ones, so I'm gonna, this is going to be around Vanguard funds to some degree, but it's not meant as a sales pitch, more, more as a is deconstruction of what it takes to be successful with active. Again, as I mentioned, we have, a, we have a trillion dollars of actively managed stuff. I'm going to focus on the equity portion of that. Right? When you look at the track record of Vanguard active, and again, this is all published, 
and you look at a 33-year period, if you were to market cap weight our exposure, so not even do it on an asset-weighted basis, just limit it to market cap weight, you're talking about a 40 basis point per year outperformance on average median for, for 33 years relative to, a, relative to an index and not a benchmark. Right? And that, that's an important point of comparison. No, nobody can buy a benchmark. Right? We all have to compare ourselves to benchmarks. But benchmarks aren't free. You have to actually have to buy the index, which costs something. So, so, so that point of comparison is, uh, is very important. So Vanguard's been able to outperform. What has led to that success? And we think this is the key to all active success. There's three things you need. You need talent, cost, and patience. Now, talent and cost can be provided by the, by the manager. The patience has to be delivered by the, by the end investor. When we talk about talent... <clears throat> It's important to think about that on an ex-ante or ex-post basis, right? What, what we do after the fact or before the fact, right? Before the fact, for us, that's a very qualitative assessment. That's people, firm. There's a lot of due diligence we do. We, we hire about, we have on about 30 sub-advisors that, that do long-only active management for Vanguard. So we are in the business of hiring external active managers, right? We've been doing that for 40 years. Um, when we do that, it's a very qualitative assessment on, on the talent side. And, again, we've published on that. That's, and even the words I'm going to use here are not dissimilar to what a lot of other people have used in terms of people, firm, process, philosophy. But then we think it's very important to marry that with low cost. And at Vanguard, the median cost for, for long-only active is 37 basis points. That's cheaper than 90% of our competitors and 70% of the indexes that are available today. So from a cost basis, that's what we think is the key driver here. It's not whether it's active or passive. It's what's the ultimate cost that you're, that you're providing that to clients. And then the third function would be patience. <clears throat> One of the things we've looked at, um, we, it's a pub, pub paper we published called The Bumpy Road to Outperformance. If you look at long-term successful funds. So we took a 15-year period and said, okay, at the end of 15 years, who was, who was successful in the public space? And you look at the people who survived and outperformed. Their pattern of success was certainly not consistent. In fact, it's about 50-50 on the number of years they're going to outperform. And this is the other thing that gets challenged, certainly for institutions who have a fiduciary responsibility, right? And they may take a three-year track record. In any short-term perspective, I throw three years into that, into, man into assessing an, an active manager is going to lead to uh, a limited ability to capture that benefit. I use this, again, in the example of Vanguard. When we hire a sub-advisor, the average tenure that we have with that sub-advisor is 13 years. If you were excluding just the people we've hired recently, include everybody we ever fired, right? But exclude the people we hired recently because we've additional cash flow, that number is 17 years. So again, you have to be patient with, with, with active managers to be able to capture the active benefit, if there is one. Uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, that's a challenge behaviorally, as, as Ken can tell you, for individuals. It's a, it's a challenge for institutions who feel they have a fiduciary responsibility, right? And if somebody's outperforming for, I don't know, three years is often a, a number that they use. <coughs> We have to take action and do something. So that's the inherent challenge. But if you look at the, if I look at the math, the math is actually the, the, the numbers for, for outperformance are actually better than we've collectively articulated in the past. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't avoid the, the behavioral issues um, with that. That's a lot of work that we've done with public funds. The other thing we did was we've, we've, we've done a, <clears throat> We've done a paper called Shopping for Alpha, which is could we look at any quantitative factor ex ante, so any factor ahead of time that would predict future success? And we looked at a long list of, uh, of elements. We looked at uh, tracking error, sharp ratio, past alpha, fund concentration, number of holdings, size of funds, cost, turnover. And I, I can tell you the one thing that we found that was statistically significant and the only thing we found that was statistically significant was cost. That cost was the only predictor of future success. It was not a guarantee. You still needed talent within that. But cost was the key factor to future success. And you know, it's in, there's some intuition behind that, obviously, right? 
which is the lower the cost and the lower the hurdle to ultimately provide the outperformance uh, in delivering that. As I said, on an, on a <clears throat> that's, the, that's the quantitative function. Our experience has been it's a qualitative assessment. And the challenge is on an, on an ex post basis, right, it's a lot easier to do attribution. And I would say if you're looking at the public space, there are probably four major elements you're looking at. And if you're looking at the private space, and I'll get there because we, we've done some articulation uh, and some research on private investments as well. And, in fact, probably a lesser known uh, secret is that Vanguard's got a couple of uh, hedge fund, uh, liquid hedge fund um, uh, products as well. But let's look on an ex post basis. If you're looking at the public space, there's probably four elements that matter, right? So you have, you have market cap exposure. You have some form of static tilt. That's factors these days is the way that's getting articulated. Timing and security selection. Those are the four main elements of where anybody can add value within a structure. Um, when we look at that, if you can do an attribution analysis to market cap and factors, then that's probably substitutable from a private manager space. You can probably get those cheaper someplace else. And that's increasingly what's happening in the... In the uh, in the investment space is you get greater and greater transparency, greater and greater attribution function. I know Peter's going to speak to this in some degree. The two other elements in terms of timing and security selection, that's where the alpha typically remains, right? That's where the substitutable function still remains. And it's, so it's that ability to deconstruct things within that attribution analysis uh, and identify the, the elements away from factors. And again, you get to limit the factors to sort of the core key factors and the market cap exposure that identifies, that identifies true alpha. Let's just pivot to private investments. I know m many of you, if not most of you, are, are LP investors. So we've done some work on, on, on privates, and let me just pivot to that. When I think about private alternatives, I think of three large buckets, right? Private equity, private real assets, and hedge funds. They're all a form of active management to me. They're not separate asset classes, right? Uh, pr private equity, that's the easiest way to think about it, right? It's another form of stock. It happens to be a private form versus public. But, the a but if you do a correlation or do an attribution analysis, the attribution to, to stock is incredibly high. If you do that on a real asset basis, you're talking about mostly real estate and commodities of, of some form or another. And then you're left with hedge funds, right? And hedge funds are a legal structure, the same way a mutual fund is a legal structure. And anything can go into hedge funds, ultimately. But if we do attribution using those four functions we talked about before, right, market cap, static tilts, which is another form of factors, timing, and security selection, and we add in trading strategies, right, the carry trade or any of those other elements, you can actually get attribution of 70 to 80 percent on most hedge fund strategies. Again, ex post, after the fact. So again, this attribution analysis is, is very, very important. Again, we go back and we look at, well, what leads to ultimate success in the alternative space? We did a, an assessment of the endowment market in the U.S. And if you look at the endowment market <clears throat> and you bifurcate that by size, so the billion-dollar-plus crowd is large, uh, the $100 million or less is small, and then everything else is in the middle, you see that the people who have been greatly successful are the billion-dollar-plus endowments. They make up about 10% of the population, but about 70% of the assets. And what has led to their great success? If you look at their asset allocation, right, it's very heavily pivoted towards alternatives. And you would think, again, the work we've done, the work others have done, strategic asset allocation is the most critical factor. Is that the key driver? And the answer is no. Right? We talked earlier that private investments for us is another form of active management. You see this in the results of the large endowments. There are three key factors that's led to success for the largest endowments, and let me just pause before I get into that. There's been work done <clears throat> by High Vista up in Boston, um, Andre Perot, Harvard Business School professor, who looked at the attribution analysis of, of endowments, and he found that the largest endowments have a, have a much higher alpha if you, if you do an attribution relative to uh, accounting for all the private alternatives much higher uh, alpha than mids and smalls along this line. And three, we look at and find three key factors that have led to that. Number one, they have expertise, right? So the large, the large endowments, Yale's the prime example of this, Harvard's another. They have much larger in-house expertise, and they've been doing it for a really, really long time. Second thing is they're not, they're not paying retail. David Swenson, 
again, the Yale CEO, has a great quote that price alone is a reason not to talk to a manager. If you look at, talk to Scott Milpass at Notre Dame, he'll say the same thing. They're negotiating fees. And then the third one is they have, they have and they use direct access. They are not using fund of funds, right? It's a 95% direct buy. And they've been doing it for a long time. If you look back uh, 10 years ago, right, there was one-tenth the number of assets in the hedge fund space that there is today. So the, 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 the competition for uh, looking for arbitrage opportunities, right, is much heavier today than it was 10 years ago when these alternative uh, investments were started by the endowments. Um, so if we look at that, <clears throat> then the last, I'll just pivot to the last part we talked about, is there a particular place, one of the questions we asked, is there a particular place where alpha is more likely to occur, one place or the other? And our experience is, is the answer is no. What you get in the private space is a lot more dispersion, but that does not lead to the probability of success, right? So if you think about that, if you look at the dispersion of active public funds, it's, it's certainly on the equity side bigger than the fixed income side. But then if you look at the private equity relative to public equity, it's much, much wider. But, but the probability of our, our performance is no greater. So, right? so we, again, some work we've done called the allure of the outlier looks at, looks at uh, alternatives. And what we find is that it's a selection at the top end that has led to great success with the alternatives, which leads us back to it's an active management decision in that space uh, to be able to do that. Well, and the last thing I'd just say about alternatives is the lack of transparency does not equal alpha. And this is one of the challenges we have in the alternative space, right, which is getting true, clear attribution analysis about any individual fund or the aggregate funds. Right? But the more that we can do that, the easier it's going to be to be a discerning investor to identify where that alpha uh, and where that expectation is. So. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to try to be uh, narrow uh, with my talk today. Uh, I'm only going to speak about equity strategies, long only, long short. Um, my goal is just to make progress and to provide sort of actionable advice. And uh, the question I'm going to try to address, and there are a lot of questions we can address on skill, is how do you even measure, realize skill? And when I say realized, I'm trying to distinguish between true skill and luck. So we first need to be able to measure realized skill or realized alpha or realized special sauce or realized value add first. Then we can have a debate about whether it was due to luck or due to true skill. Okay? And so whenever we have this discussion, we go straight to skill versus luck, we're assuming... <laughs> that we actually have a process in place that's reasonable for equity strategies, long only, long short, where we can measure realized skill. Second, we assume people are actually doing it. Okay? So I want to step back and try to address that fundamental question and try to make progress. And I can tell you, as somebody who's faced off against hundreds and hundreds of active long only and long short equity managers that we are not using a reasonable process, I believe, to measure realized skill. No process is ever picked, is, ne is ever perfect, but we are not using what I would call proper attribution, what Daniel was talking about, yet we're having a lot of conversations about skill versus luck. Now, what do I mean by we're not using proper attribution. I would tell you, and again, I'm just speaking generalities, we're all different, that in general, when people look at long-only equity managers, they're still focusing on, well, value add, the realized skill is just their return relative to a benchmark. If it's a long-short equity manager, I would say in general, and again, this is what happened at very sophisticated institutions as an allocator that I worked at. For a long short equity manager, we tend there's a tendency to just focus on the total return. And that's the gauge of realized skill. And then we can have a debate about whether it, happened, it was due to luck or due to true skill. But as, as was uh, already alluded to by Daniel and, and others, we know that 
that relative return, the long only return relative to a bench or the long short equity manager's total return could have embedded betas in there. Okay, so we've all heard that before. Sometimes some of us, uh, we control for uh, market exposure, uh, but we know <coughs> managers sometimes have industry biases all the time. It's static. It's not timing, it's static. They have country biases. They have biases to certain styles. The number of managers I come across who have a small cap bias all the time or have a momentum bias. Those are style biases, okay? So it's really important to control for those static biases because by definition, when I say beta, it's not a scarce resource. It's something that's readily available. Yes, there's an art to creating some of these betas, so I don't want to make it sound like a pure commodity, but for sure, it doesn't reach the definition of realized skill in my book, unless it's timing, but I'm talking about static beta. The second thing that's important when you're thinking about, when you're looking at your manager's return and trying to understand the source of that return, you need to control for what I call unintentional beta, okay? Unintentional beta, in my book, means it was due to chance. Now, maybe it made you money to be in healthcare. Maybe it lost you money. But if you tell me the reason why you're in that healthcare name has nothing to do with the industry, it's because of the firm-specific facts, which is the norm for discretionary equity managers in active space that I faced off against. They are usually focusing on the idiosyncratic features of a particular stock. They are stock pickers. If that's the case, you need to hold them accountable for just that idiosyncratic stock picking part of the return, which means you need to know that if their process leads to unintentional bets in a particular industry, in a particular country, in a particular style, you need to be able to reverse that out because it was unintentional, right? Okay? So we're not doing that in practice. That leads to a lot of noise when trying to then assess whether that realized skill is due to luck versus true skill, okay? Now, some of you would say, hey, Pete, I'm already doing some attribution. But I would push back and say someone who's been on the been in your seat before, that at most you're getting attribution at the country and industry level. Very few people in practice, whether it's the manager or the investor, are trying to control for those style biases. Do you have a small cap tilt? Do you have a systematic momentum tilt that you call catalyst investing? Do you have a value bias? Do you have a low volatility bias, okay? And for the few people, and I stress few, who really try to hold their manager accountable, try to understand the true source of the return, try to control for the small cap bias, most of them, most of them are just using returns. You get a set of returns from your manager, you have a set of factors that represent those betas, and you try to isolate what part of the return from this regression is due to the beta and what part's unexplained, and we'll call that realized stock selection or realized skill. The problem with looking at returns is returns are very noisy. Think about a world where you're trying to do an annual review with your manager, and you have 12 monthly observations and you're trying to control for the various countries that they might have static bets for, the various industries that they might have static bets for, the various styles, you have 12 data points. You can't do it. It's impossible, right? So what's the solution? The solution is you need to actually look at the actual holdings of the manager. You've got to go beyond the return, the headline return. Let's say a manager holds 100 stocks, and you know those 100 stocks at any point in time. That is so much more information than knowing 
the return in a particular month. There are an infinite number of portfolios that can get you that return. But if you actually know the holdings, you know the characteristics of each of those stocks. So answering questions like, well, how much country exposure did they have in a particular country? How much industry exposure did they have? Is it a small cap stock? Is it a large cap stock? Is it a stock that's done recently well? And we'll call that a momentum stock. Does it have a low PE? And we're gonna call that a value stock. So the great thing about looking at holdings and doing holdings-based attribution is you get a ton of information it's not perfect, but a ton of information relative to just observing the return, and it gives you a hope, just a hope, of being able to isolate the part of the return from your manager that's not due to beta, okay? Now, is holdings-based attribution new where you're controlling for styles? No, it's been around for, so the great thing about what I'm gonna try to tell you today is this is old school technology, okay? So holdings-based attribution, if some of you have heard of Barra or Axioma or Northfield, that's been around. But the fact of the matter is no, very few people do it. Investors don't do it. Managers don't do it. Why? Because to have a Barra, you have to pay money. It's not readily available, and I would say unfairly, I think a lot, since most managers are discretionary managers, uh, for some reason, they don't see the, the use or the value of having a holdings-based attribution system. Some of it might be ignorance, but the reality is this is technology that has been available. It gives you much more information, but yet no one's doing it, or very few people are doing it. So why am I here talking about this? To just tell you, hey, we're gonna continue not using it because it costs money and it's not readily available? The reason why I'm talking about this is because there's been a big advancement in my opinion. Not in terms of are there better attribution models. No, this is old school. It's the availability of the attribution models. So Bloomberg recently upgraded their attribution model. It's holdings-based. It controls for country, controls for industry, controls for the, the main styles that you would care about as a, an investor. It's not a better model than Barra, but what does Bloomberg have as an advantage over Barra or any other type of analytical software vendor? Is every manager, pretty much, discretionary, systematic, fundamental, quant, has a Bloomberg. So when I used to call up my managers and ask, can you give me proper attribution? And they said, I don't have that stuff. I'm not gonna pay for it. I'm not gonna hire 10 PhDs to do it for you. Now, it's on your Bloomberg terminal. Your holdings are already in Bloomberg or they can easily be put in Bloomberg. So today, what I think is the game changer is the fact that Bloomberg is making this old technology that allows you to have so much more information, it's now making it available to the masses because all managers have a Bloomberg. So it's incrementally free, right? There's no charge for this, okay? <laughs> it um, provides a common yardstick. It might be imperfect. Again, it's not, no model is perfect, but now you're actually using a common yardstick across your equity managers. While before, if all of your managers were doing proper attribution but did it in their own proprietary way, it'd be really hard to compare. It would be much better than where we are today. Don't get me wrong, right? It's really easy to understand the output, okay? So that's great. It's, it's easy to use, easy to understand. It's a game changer, in, in my opinion. And, and again, you might ask, how did I uncover this? I was sitting in a meeting with a long, short, famous emerging market manager who could invest in the EM consumer theme. He could invest around the world in any company as long as the company had some revenue from the EM consumer theme, which means he was in every freaking country. It didn't have to be emerging markets. He had, he had static uh, country uh, differences 
relative to like an MSCI Emerging Markets benchmark, which he used to measure his long book alpha and short book alpha. He had currency mismatches. He had style mismatches. He had, he had a, small, a small cap tilt in a, in a momentum bias. And, and I'm like, at the end of the call, we both agreed. So we were both on the same side. Looking at my long book or my short book relative to MSCI EM tells you nothing. But I had to pick a benchmark. Nothing in terms of my realized skill. And I said, do you have any attribution? And he's like, no. And so I was on a mission. So I went, I, I called up Barr and Axioma. I begged them to give free attribution to our managers. And what was, it, what was, what was in it for them? They were going to get their foot in the door. Potential business, show the value of their attribution capabilities. <clears throat> and I was fortunate enough that Axioma, the guy I spoke with, was like, well, I'll think about it. But, you know, Pete, you might want to look at Bloomberg. Bloomberg sort of does a poor job on marketing. But if you change some settings, they actually have a institutional quality, holdings-based attribution model that's going to solve most of your problems. And so I was off to the races. And I've been trying since last year to spread the word. So I think the opportunity here is that if you start leveraging holdings-based attribution that incorporates styles, because that's important, off of a Bloomberg, because all managers pretty much have Bloomberg, right? The opportunity is you get to upgrade the dialogue on did you add any value this quarter or this year or whatever time period you're looking at, right? Do you have any realized stock selection? Do you have any realized alpha, any realized skill? So that's, that's the opportunity. The implications, in my opinion, based on the managers I've seen where I've done returns-based attribution versus the holdings-based, is I think the bar is going to be higher. It's going to, it's, it's going to be higher in terms of does your manager actually have realized skill, which is different than true skill versus luck. Because it's been my experience that a lot of managers have unintentional, unintentional beta bets. And I know they're unintentional because I met with them. Are you trying to take a bet on this industry? No. Are you trying to take a bet on this style? No. Okay, I need to reverse that out. So it's been my experience that when you actually do the holdings-based attribution, you're going to get a different answer. Okay? And I would say... Other managers are statically giving you some style exposure. And once you do holdings-based attribution where you control for styles, you will no longer call that realized alpha or realized skill. So I think the implication is, in my opinion, not only will you have uh, uh, more information to be able to make better inferences, but I do think of the few managers that show that realized skill, I think we'll probably even see less. Based on, based on my experience. Now, the risk, the risk is that people are going to overuse this, right? All models are false by definition. Eugene Fama, who is my dissertation advisor, said that in, like, class number two, okay? So the Bloomberg model, it, it's false, okay? The Barr model, it's false. It's not perfect. It's based on assumptions. It's based on assumptions. There's an art to attribution, Okay, so my concern is that people will find this new little toy and become a slave to the toy, and that's wrong. It's a complex process, underwriting a manager and evaluating a manager, but we shouldn't allow perfection to become an excuse not to make progress. This does meet the definition of, does it materially improve the dialogue? And I think it does. And that's why I think you guys should be using it. You should be asking your manager who has the Bloomberg terminal, if you don't, to see the information. And I think you're going to have much better dialogue with your manager. I argue to managers, you're going to have much better dialogue with your analysts because you'll have a better sense of what was driven by a beta, an unintentional or static beta, versus something that was truly idiosyncratic. And I think what I'm trying to do today is, because most people don't know about the availability of this tool, is to just make it available and to let you know about it, and you should start using it. And so I do have, uh, at the end of the session, I do have a one-page handout 
to try to fulfill par partially that obligation is the one-page handout just tells you where is this Bloomberg tool, how do you find it, how do you use it, and if you have any more questions uh, where you can find the answers. But uh, that's what I wanted to talk today, and that's something that uh, hopefully will uh, um, move the active management industry uh, forward, even if forward means you're going to have tougher conversations, but I think they'll be more accurate conversations, and it's not perfect. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. My head is spinning a little bit. Would you, would you, would you all agree that there is, um, that realized skill exists in all asset classes and all strategies? You just have to find it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I, if I could, right. I, one, one of the things we often ask is, is there a better place or a better time for active management? And our fundamental answer, again, based on research, there's no particular time and there's no particular space. It's all based on core characteristics we, I talked about before. To me, it's talent, cost, and patience, where, and that can be anywhere. That can truly be anywhere. Is it, it's not easier to find in any particular place? So the privates maybe, it you know? goes back to you get greater dispersion in certain places, right? And so it looks like there's more, there, there might be better uh, alpha, but that's just a distance from your median. That's not necessarily the probability that there's more. So if, you, if you're looking for a higher level of alpha, right, there's certain places that have wider dispersion. You, you, your outliers are going to be wider. That's up on the upside and on the downside. But if you're looking for the, pro, where, where, is there a place where the probability of finding an outperformer is greater. We, we don't necessarily see that on a consistent basis in any one place versus another, particularly when you control for the factor structure that, uh, that Peter was talking about. And I would just add on the, the private versus public side, uh, I just was talking about public equity and how we're not using old school technology on holdings-based attribution controlling for styles and how we could really upgrade the dialogue. That being said, the attribution on public equity 100 times better than the attribution on private equity. I've gone through that, too, with, with our private equity team. What does that mean? That means with that opaqueness, with that lack of attribution on the private side, storytelling wins and because there's no way to disprove it. And as a result, that's why I feel like you end up with, well, that's why on the private side there's more, more alpha or there's more chance of skill. And I'm just saying the reality is the data is so bad on the private side that it, you know, you're, you're putting your hand on a, st a, st a stack of religious books when you're, when you're making an assessment there. Comic books. Yeah, uh, comic books. Yeah, just um, I guess I would argue that um, it depends on defining skill is, is a very difficult exercise. Um, Certainly, one of the things that we see is a number of the common strategies that are used. For example, in let's say long short equity mutual funds, um, the you know Peter mentioned value momentum. Um, one of the things that I think we've become more and more aware of over the last couple of decades is how subject the returns of these strategies are to flows. And um, you know, for those of you who uh, I know I was at, at Goldman in, at the time in the quant business, and I know AQR suffered very much in this period in August 2007 when there were really, really massive flows over a very, very short time period. Um, now, the problem is, you know, this results from crowding. How do you measure crowding? It's a really, really difficult thing to do. But I guess I remain convinced that certainly there are some, uh, there are some indicators that have come out in the academic <coughs> literature. I'm not sure they're super reliable. But I think, um, yeah, there are, this stuff definitely is forecastable with the right measures. So thank you again. Oh, well, let's open it up for questions and comments from you folks. Yeah, go ahead. I just had a question. Um, one of you mentioned patience in terms of picking managers, and you also didn't talk about flows. Can you comment on sort of the proliferation of daily liquidity, whether it's ETFs? Active or, or passive, and how you know there's some charts that uh, JP Morgan used to publish, or Peter Lynch used to talk about, because you guys are all comparing passive versus active, assuming everyone gets the same return in the active strategy. In reality, particularly in things that are daily liquidity, they don't. And the JP Morgan chart, for example, the way they depict it, it's a 75% of the return is taken away from the average investor because of their emotional, you know, inadequacies. 
talk about that. And more money is actually going into that type of investing. Yeah. Do you, if, maybe I'll start. Maybe you can yeah. you can follow up with the with the academics. So let me give you the so the practitioner way we we think about that, which is, and I think the point you're raising is very valid. Which is, I was talking about median active experience. There's still a selection function within that, right? So you have a distribution around the. It, you know, if there's a median number, it, it's about fifty fifty. If you're going to get even among long term winning, right? If you're going to be successful or not. So. There, there's still that selection challenge, right? And, and when are you going to know within that? Again, it takes a long time to be able to, to ultimately um, capture that. And that's the, that's the challenge. And if you look at, and it's true, on both, it's true on both indexes and active, that the published return numbers are different than the actual cash flow investor numbers, where the cash flow investor numbers are lower than the published numbers. But that to us goes back to this patience function. And again, I'll just, I, I think timing is, you know, politely is very hard. And our core thing is you know, nearly impossible to do it effectively. But everybody feels this emotion to move and to try and take some action. And that goes back to the ability to commit and stay with something. And it's very hard for all of us to collectively do. But that's, I think, I think your point is well taken that that's a, that's a subsequent challenge that we're all dealing with. Yeah, um, there's, um, let me just mention one really interesting paper. You wouldn't think this would be an area where you would see this, but it turns out if you look at the broader stock market, if you look at measured returns versus dollar returns, they're very different. Um, so specifically, it goes back to the point that uh, I mentioned earlier from this Baker and Wurgler paper, that when firms do a lot of issuing, obviously the average investor buys those issues, right? Uh, it turn, and similarly, when firms are paying a lot of dividends, when they're basically taking cash out of the market, the average investor participates in those. If you leave your money in the market, you earn a much, much higher return. It turns out this one paper looks internationally, and they find your return from staying steady, from staying continuously invested and not participating in the new issues or the repurchases, leads to about a 1.5% per year higher return. It turns out if you look in the NASDAQ since inception, you're about 5% higher. So basically the really, largely because of the tech bubble. Um, but we see the same thing at the fund level. There's some evidence from some new papers that shows that, um, that you know, again, the dollar returns from investing in funds are much, much lower than the average returns. Because when they do well, people throw money in. When they do poorly, people pull out. And these short-term fluctuations are not as predictive as people think they are. Basically, there's a tendency among people to look at short horizon returns as indicators of the level of skill, when a lot of it's just noise. Do they offer a version of their passive that you can only take money out once a year? Yeah, that wouldn't be called a mutual fund. That would be, that, that would be something else. Uh, you know, that, that's – I, I could – that's to us where we think there's still there, there's value in financial advisors or in a, a human relationship as a behavioral coach, right? To try and protect us against the emotion of tr of fixing a problem. Right? I, I often feel as Yogi Berra had a great a great description about the the Veterans Committee at the Hall of Fame. I mean, his his view of what that committee was was to add somebody to the Hall of Fame, right? Not to decide whether somebody was worthy or not, but we're here, so who are we going to elect? Not should we elect somebody, right? It's like we're, you got you to gotta do something. And I think we all have that sense about trying to fix problems, right, or, or avoid, avoid uh, difficulty. Um, it, and one thing that to bring it back to what Daniel said during his talk, whenever I come across these people who are focused on timing their managers or their mutual funds, I'll step back and say, so tell me about your strategic asset allocation and how it's consistent with your uh, objectives in life. And they'll be like, it's deer in the headlights. Uh, I haven't really thought about that, how much stocks, how much bonds, how much real estate. It's like getting that strategic asset allocation right is like 90% of the problem, right? And it's amazing that Mindshare is focused on trying to time a manager or fund when we've we're here talking about whether those managers who are super, super talented, at least on paper, whether they can give you any realized skill. And now an investor is going to try to use their manager picking skills to time that strategy 
and yet they're spending almost no time on making sure their strategic asset allocation is consistent with their portfolio objectives, whether that's long-run expected return or their risk tolerance. So step back, remember the big picture, spend your time, and if you're going to worry at all, worry on the important things like getting that strategic asset allocation right. Yes. So let, let me let me let me uh, clarify that. So when I when I say they're the same, the risk structure to me, right? The fundamental when you talk about strategic asset allocation, they're both forms of equity. So if you're going to add private equity to your portfolio, I think of that as a portion of your overall equity exposure. Now you can have the choice about what type you you want to do, um, and. And the the correlation between public and private is, is is right they're right on top of each other. Now it's another form of active to me, so that you may choose to try and extract benefit from private equity versus another one. You have to accept the the, the illiquidity premium. Certainly, you have to accept that. You should be getting pay, certainly you should be getting paid for that. So we've done some again. If you go back to the allure of the outlier paper that we published. We looked at it, and again, it, when you talk about private equity, it's important to talk about what type. You're talking about VC, LBO. Sixty percent of, of private equity is in, is in LBO these days, right, not, not VC. And, if you, and the performance difference between the two is, is pretty great, right? But if you account for a 300 basis point liquidity premium, the median experience for us in our calculations for public and private is right on top of each other. Now, you may want to capture that that illiquidity premium by saying I'm willing to live with the, you know, not touching it and I'll capture that benefit. But if, uh, but you're get, you know, you're getting compensated for uh, ultimately for taking a, for taking that risk and you should recognize it, you know, ultimately as that. And the illiquidity premium, one thing to keep in mind, you have to remember the typical private equity fee, I think I saw a number is like five or 6% annualized. If you sort of looked over the last, let's call it 20 years. So, you would have to believe in a liquidity premium that was 8 or 9% such that there was anything left over for you, the investor, right? So that's just something, again, this is a very, it's a very simple first-pass thought, but I, I feel like when people talk about private equity as someone, again, who's been sold private equity in our strategic asset allocation and people talk about this illiquidity premium, you have to remember in order for you to get any of it, it's got to overcome all of those fees. And, and again, if I could just underscore, I don't think of it as a separate asset class, right? It's a, it's a manager selection function. To be successful in private equity, you have to pick a good manager. Please. Just to follow up on that, I guess that you were always talking about on the public equity side, there is uh, well, a lot more data out there. I mean, on the private side, there's a little, I guess, um, the private equity probably, the typical buyout of those probably have a, If I could, I think the way we've been describing it, I think you has to, there has to be a qualitative assessment, right? But then you're trying to get to what Pete has been talking about, try to do factor analysis, right, and deconstruction of where those returns are coming. And I would say, I don't know if it's in the private side so much as the, the, the hedge fund side, you have to, when you're going to do attribution analysis, there's the standard value, size, all of that. But when you're talking about hedge funds, you also want to do trading strategies, the carry trade, right, the currency trade. There's a series of those that are pretty well known, and you want to be able to do attribution around that. Not easy to do, but that's ultimately you want to see where, and again, we're working on some stuff we haven't published it yet to do exactly that, but you want to deconstruct where are those returns coming from, and are they effectively substitutable on your basis in a much cheaper form? Because a lot of those factors are perfectly available to you directly if that's what you want to do. Sure. 
So, but just actually a comment in terms of uh, uh, private capital. I think the illiquidity premium of the paper, you might want to break into two pieces on the debt side and on the equity side because debt is a creditor. You may say, look, there's liquid instruments in the debt market. I do want to be paid for that, tying up that money. Whereas on the equity side, you may say, look, this is what's necessary to build a successful business. And if I have a long time horizon, why should I be compensated for, for being illiquid? So I would suggest separating that. The other thing I'd say, just in terms of uh, private equity versus public equity, I mean, there are some myths around private equity, things such as that in tumultuous times, you can step up and put capital to work. I find it's actually, um, it reinforces cyclicality uh, because in 2008, 2009, the private equity firms, most of them could not step up. First, they were dealing with all their past problems, and then they had clients who really didn't want them to uh, call capital. So, and on top of that, no no one is wants to sell their, their company at a certain price, whereas in the public equity market. And the, the other side of it, when times are really great, the private equity funds come out and ask for more money, and if you don't step up, then you're, you're taken out of the, the queue. And so it, it kind of re reinforces investing in the, the high part of the market. I would say that private equity people, they often say, well, they're protecting investors from themselves. This point of people going into funds on a, a dollar weighted basis at the wrong time, that, that doesn't speak necessarily well to the private equity funds, but the investors themselves can't be funding it now. Um, but my other comment, my, my real question really is, why don't we see more long-only equity managers Because I've found that there is a lot of, uh, there are managers that have a great deal of value. They take on uncompensated risks. And uh, they don't have the techniques or the desire to hedge them out. Hedge funds who do have the techniques and the desire have very high fees. And I've been surprised that there aren't more firms, let's say, like an adage to you know, run a 140 40 strategy and focus on taking out the unintended uh, risks. And so if there are any comments in terms of why that that kind of uh, gap exists between traditional long only managers and the, the, the hedge fund managers, why there's not more in between. If I could. Um, so if you look at the largest, the fastest growing segment of the mutual fund industry, it's liquid alternatives. Now that's because it's going off of a, this base, the lowest base, right? But th there, is, there is an increasing interest in exactly what you just described. I think the challenge with that is two parts. One, the fee structure in that still is enormous. Um, so to be, to be able to capture the benefit to the investor is still a challenge. And it's this in-between place, right? So if it's a liquid form to try and do that, you, you know, who's the typical buyer of a public security? It's potentially not as sophisticated as on a private side. So people have to understand what this is. It's much more sold than bought. And it's a, I think the traction is more challenging uh, ultimately because of that. But there is an increased uh, sort of melding of those two markets, um, looking at trading strategies, looking at long short leverage, looking at factor exposure, all of that. They're, it's small, but it's a, it's a growing place. I think the challenge is finding people who understand what it is and have a desire to buy it in a public form. And I would say also I think there's a presumption that, like, they can add value by having this flexibility of the short. And I can tell you my own experience, again, in front of more traditional long-short hedge fund managers, that um, a lot of them are just using index hedges. So they're actually not trying – they're shorting the entire market. They're not even trying to sort of find alpha – or stock selection on the short side, and they get a ton of heat from investors. Like, well, you're a long short equity manager, um, and you're charging me high fees if you're not adding value on the short side. And you might say, well, they're providing a hedge. Well, if you already own long only equity somewhere else in your portfolio, you could just take that down. You don't need this manager to put on an index hedge and quadruple the fees, right? So again, don't assume just because you have the flexibility to go short that they're actually providing a, you know, a, a better value proposition. So that's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few minutes. Uh, 
Sure. One more. Maybe. One more. Yeah. Just a question with with regard to evaluating skill and looking at attribution of a manager. So, if, if, if how important is it that you have full transparency into the position level data? Because if, if you maybe only have um, you know the long side of the, of the hedge fund, do you find that assessing the skill on the long side necessarily translates into the short side as well, or do you need the short side? Here, let me start off here because this is a great question because this comes up all the time because I thought about this before I reached out to any of our managers after I found the Bloomberg tool. I needed to have a response if one of them said, I need to protect, protect the confidentiality of my shorts or, or some type of a privacy issue with the positions they hold. So I made sure that within Bloomberg, it was possible to get all of the relevant attribution summary results that you need as an investor without seeing a single position. So it protects all of the managers, longs and shorts, which names, the portfolio weights. That's behind the scene. The manager can see it, but your manager just has to hit a couple of buttons and send you the output. So um, uh, you do want to see the full book. You do want your manager, if they're unwilling to give you the information, it's actually just easier. Have your manager run it. Say, I don't even want to know your positions. You want to look at the whole book, and you can do that and respect their privacy by using something like the holdings-based attribution tool within Bloomberg. And you want the whole book. Back to you. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, okay, a couple of housekeeping items before we go. Uh, I'm going to defer to Connie again. Connie, when's, uh, when are we meeting here again? July 21st. July 21st. And, Ray, if I ever get my act together, we will be talking about um, a subject called pure passive. Um, in this, we're known as the temple of alternatives, perhaps, but um, we're going to talk about um, how do you do it and what are the risks of going um, Passive. Um, this might be one of t what Ted Seides calls an empty room, <laughs> where <laughs> maybe uh, maybe that's the way to go. But uh, I, I don't think we're going to be well attended on that one. But having said that, we'll uh, we'll meet here in July. You never know. You never know. Uh, so okay, that was uh, this session was the uh, we're going to uh, hit the play button. We uh, last year when we met on skill, uh, we put the pause. Button for the Education Committee. We were talking about um, uh, writing the next best practices document um, called Terms and Conditions, really hitting, uh, hitting home this notion of fees. Well, we had a couple of um, committee meetings, and um, what, uh, you know, our mandate for that uh, best practice document is going to be coming up with a valuation framework for a manager's fee proposition. Uh, so far, and um, our panelists might uh, be interested in hearing this, um, we've come up with some qualities that we're going to be uh, uh, plumbing and um, plumbing the depths on, and they are um, uh, information asymmetry, uh, lack of competition, uh, inefficient pricing, and the ability to influence the outcome. So far, that's why we're paying a fee premium, but we want to we hang some facts and um, you know, some actual practi practitioners' um, research behind that. Uh, and then finally, as the group historian, I'd like to bring up some other things that have uh, been said here at the roundtable over the years um, in relation to what's been said here today. Uh, so, okay, um, last year we heard Charlie Ellis say, and you've probably heard this many times, but price discovery is almost perfect. Um, and then we've heard um, uh, Diana Frazier, when she was at Flag many, many moons ago, uh, say, venture is an access class. Uh, and your Rolodex matters. So uh, it's, it's all about the Rolodex and your access to these, these uh, top quality managers. And then in 2007, we wrote in, um, Phil will remember this, in, in Best Practices on Portfolio Construction, um, collect quality managers when they become available. And then you say, well, you know, how do I know their quality? And as the judge said, um, I know it when I see it. So um, that, that's from uh, 2007. And then... Um, uh, Kent's um, uh, colleague, and as he mentioned earlier, uh, Michael Mobison said back in 2005, the crowd is usually right. 
um, and that being a contrarian only works 5% of the time, striking. So uh, that was very, very interesting. And then finally, I'll, I'll wrap this up, but then um, um, Pete's colleague has said <clears throat> very recently, a lot of hedge fund managers are pricing their fund as though there's some magic involved, and there's not. So that, that was really interesting. And we'll, we'll put this in, I mean, these are all anecdotes that uh, really serve to uh, guide our group. And then finally, with respect to patients, uh, Peter Bernstein said in 2005, uh, Yale, um, the average tenure of the manager at Yale is 17 years. And the re reason uh, Swenson uh, is so successful is because the Yale Investment Committee protected him when they were down. And uh, he allowed these managers to stay in the portfolio. And uh, the Yale Investment Committee allowed uh, Swenson to keep his job. So um, that, that's about it, and uh, just in relation to what the managers have said today. But I also want to thank Kurt for putting this together. Uh, Kurt, you should have been a speaker today. Um, those are very interesting uh, you know, um, uh, statistics. And then finally, I'd like to uh, recognize Kurt for um, their good work and what they're doing investor in terms of investor education. But more specifically, they've just put out um, an asset uh, manager's code of conduct, is it? Uh, in pensions and investments in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, again, with our ethos or one of our bylines is to, um, you know, uh, managing other people's money is a sacred trust. And uh, I think that that reflects, uh, that's been reflected. In, and, uh, you know, I want to say thank you. And job well done. When you ask for the performance or for the holdings based attribution, I also ask whether they're AMC compliant. So. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. Good job. Thank you.